And let's begin by looking at the uh, word parts in the chapter, which are on uh, pages 275 and 276. On uh, 275, starting there at the top, we have bilio, which means bile, it's produced by the uh, liver. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail later. Then we have two spellings of the word part. The first one is pronounced cilio, and the, other, the second one is cillo. Um, and they both mean abdomen. And because there is a difference in pronunciation, these will be dictated separately. Where in the next word part, <clears throat> we have two spellings with the same pronunciation of a word part. The um, word part is, is pronounced kylo. The CH has a K sound. And as you can hear, that E is silent. And so the second uh, spelling of this word part is acceptable, however, the C-H-E-I-L-O is the more acceptable. In other words, you should use the first one. However, the second one is acceptable. And because they are both pronounced the same way, on the test what I'll do is I'll say, give me both spellings of Kylo. And so you'll spell it both ways on the same line. Whereas on the, the previous one, because they are pronounced different, they will be pronounced two different times or separate. Kylo means lip. The next one <clears throat> is actually two word parts put together, coli and doco. So you would think of it as being pronounced coli doco. <coughs> Excuse me. However, because of where the emphasis is placed, it is actually going to be pronounced coladoco. Coladoco. <coughs> so when you're working with coli and doco, putting them together, Think of pronounce, pronouncing it coled o co. Now the coli, the C-H-O-L-E means bile, and the D-O-C-H-O means duct. So coled o co means bile duct. Then we have colio, which is that same word part that's being used in the first part of the previous word part. Colio, which means bile. And then there's another pronunciation taking the E off, colo. C-H-O-L-O, which means bile. Then we have a word part C-O-L-O, which is also pronounced colo. So we have a C-H-O-L-O, pronounced colo, which means bile, and a C-O-L-O, -O, pronounced colo, which means the colon or the large intestine. And to keep these straight, if you'll notice in the example, they have uh, for C-H-O-L-E-O -E and C-H-O-L-O, they have cholecystitis. We're also going to have a word cholecystectomy that you're going to have to spell and define. So when I'm pronouncing these words in the word parts to keep the C-H-O-L-O -O and the C-O-L-O -O separated, I will say colo as in cholecystitis or cholecystectomy, which should tell you that that's the C-H-O-L because the C-O-L would not normally be used with cyst. It would not be united with that word part. On the C-O-L-O, -O, I'll pronounce colo as in colostomy. And most of you are probably familiar with or have heard the word colostomy, which is where they make an opening to the outside by passing the, the large intestine. And um, <clears throat> so that should tell you that that's the C-O-L. And right now, that's probably still kind of unclear, but as we're practicing the words, I'll do that same thing and you'll get in the habit and <coughs> shouldn't be any trouble for the test. And on colo, C-O-L-O, -O, it's defined in the book as colon, but on the worksheet or study sheet, I tell you to also define it as large intestine. Cysto means a bladder or sac. And there really is a difference. A sac is a bladder, but a bladder is not necessarily a sac. Uh, because the word bladder can con connotate an actual body part, whereas a sac would be used, uh, could be used in relationship to a, a growth that's not normal. 
Um, so you really need to define cysto with both bladder and sac. Entero, entero, do not want to confuse this with the enter we've had before, which was I-N-T-E-R. This one is E-N-T-E-R, and then O on the end, entero, and it means intestine. It is an all-inclusive word relating to the intestine. Esophago, <clears throat> esophago is the word part for esophagus, and we briefly talked about esophagus in the respiratory system, because remember the esophagus is what connects to the back of the throat behind the trachea, and it's what allows food to go from the throat down into the stomach. Gastro means stomach. Gingivo, gingivo relates to the gum. Glosso, glosso means your tongue. Hepero, hepatico, and hepato, that's hepero, hepatico, and hepato. All three of those mean liver. <coughs> and hopefully I'll have my voice back. <coughs> <clears throat> On 276, we have ilio, <clears throat> which <clears throat> is defined here as ileum, I-L-E-U-M. Now, when we study the musculoskeletal system next semester, we're <coughs> going to have another word part, ilio, I-L-I-O, which is the word part for ilium, I-L-I-U-M, which is a part of the hip. The only reason I'm telling you about that one right now is because sometimes people work ahead and they might run across that word, and I don't want you thinking it's a typographical error because there are two ileos, one with an E, one with an I, and they both stand for ilium, but two different spellings. But we'll be working with the I-L-E-O. Laparo, laparo min, means abdomen, and abdomen is one of those words that when you Spell abdomen, it's M-E-N, but if we're using the adjective form abdominal, the E is changed to an I and it's spelled M-I-N. Laryngo is a familiar term, which means larynx is the, the book gives for the definition, but I would like for you to remember this as voice box. <clears throat> Odonto relates to the tooth. P-H-A-G-O, phago means to eat. Pharyngo is a familiar term, which is defined in the book as pharynx. However, what did we learn that the pharynx is? The throat, right, the back of the throat or the throat. So define that as the throat. Procto, procto means the anus, and we're gonna find that the anus is the last part of the large intestine. P-Y-L-O is pronounced pylo, and P-Y-L-O-R-O is pronounced pyloro, and they both uh, stand for the pylorus, and you're going to identify what this is in um, several different places. But the pylorus is a part of, uh, between the stomach and the small intestine. Silo, S-I-A-L-O, silo, which means salivary. Your salivary glands are what cause your mouth to water when you start smelling food. It's the first stage of digestion. And then stomato and stomo, and they both mean mouth. And if you're not careful, when you first hear those, uh, especially the stomato, you almost would want to think of what? Stomach. stomach. However, what you've got to realize is that stomach is a variation of this word part, and the stomach is a mouth because it's an opening to the intestines. And of course, an opening is just simply some place where something goes before it uh, goes into another part. And so the stomach is actually a mouth to the intestines. Okay, so those are the word parts out of the book. Now, over on the uh, page four of the study sheet, I'm having to, you to add or change the following. Of course, and we've had before meaning not. Colo is a change, defining as a large intestine and not colon. If you want to remember colon as well, that's fine, but if you're going to put colon, you must also put large intestine. Dia, D-I-A means through. Dipsa relates to thirst. Diz, we've had before. 
ectomy we've had before. Emesis relates to vomiting. That's why when you go to the hospital and they give you that little funny shaped uh, object and they call it an emesis basin, they want you to throw up in that if you have to. So that's why it's referred to as an emesis bas basin. So emesis means vomiting. Hemat is a, a review word. Intra is a review word. Itis is a review word. Laringo is a review word, and, but it's also in this section, and it's also a change because I want you to define it as voice box. Orexis, orexis relates to appetite. <clears throat> so like when you hear that anorexia nervoso, that's relating to uh, the appetite. Pan, P-A-N, when you see that word part, it means all. So if pan something, it means everything. Pepsis relates to digestion. Aha, now we know why Pepto-Bismol is named as such. Because Pepto-Bismol you take to help you with digestion problems. Perry is a review word, I believe. Faringo is a review word, but also a change because it is listed in this section. Um, but then it's also a change on the sheet because I want you to remember it as throat, not pharynx. Poly means many excessive. That's a review, I believe. Rhea relates to a flow. Now, earlier we had dia, D-I-A, which meant through. Rhea means flow. If you have diarrhea, it means it throws, flows right through you. Okay. Stalsis, stalsis is a contraction. And ven is a word part that we had before, except I think before we had an O on the end of it. And it was pronounced veno. But as I've told you before, those combining vowels, remember, don't change the, ma the basic word. So ven, V-E-N, is our basic word here, including vein. And then, of course, you have this illustration that I gave you a copy of, and uh, you'll want to be learning the parts, and we'll talk about that in more detail. to go back to page three on the study sheet and go through the spelling words. <clears throat> okay, starting on the left-hand column there, <clears throat> on page 265 in the textbook, we have the words digestion, absorption, alimentary canal, and peristalsis. Now the first three are going to be used in theory, and that's why they're spelling words only. And then the last one is a spelling definition as indicated by the asterisks. On 267, we have hemorrhoidal veins, mesentery, greater omentum and lesser omentum. And all four of those are spelling words only. On page 270, we have gastric analysis, <coughs> gastric analysis, fissure, fistula, and diarrhea. Now you see why I had dia and rhea as word parts. On 271, we have diverticulitis, reflux esophagitis, ascites, ascites, cirrhosis, cirrhosis, and you'll notice there that that H is silent, cirrhosis. And then we have Leonex cirrhosis. Now in the textbook, it has it cirrhosis comma and then Leonex because this is a type of cirrhosis. However, the doctor would not dictate it that way. They would not say cirrhosis, Leonex. They would say Leonex cirrhosis. So that's why I switched it around from the way it is in the book, and that's the way it will be di dictated. Celiac sprue, celiac sprue, ileitis, ileitis, and dyspepsia. Pepsia means digestion, and dys means difficult or painful or bad. So uh, that one should be pretty easy to define. On the right-hand column, starting at the top, on page 266, we have pharynx, esophagus, sphincters, 
And that one, when you look at that word, that PH has an F sound. So it sounds like you're saying speak like that. Okay, but what you have to remember is that that F sound is actually PH. So you have S, and then for that, you have PH. The I is not an I, but it, or excuse me, it is an I here. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. Okay, so S, P, H, I, N, and then the K is not a K, but a C. So that F is really what you have to remember that it's a PH. Okay, whereas in that sphygmomanometer that we learned, that I was a Y there. Okay. <coughs> So sphincters, ruga, that can also be pronounced rugi, duodenum, which can also be pronounced duodenum, hepatic duct, cystic duct, and common bile duct. And I'm going to show you on the illustration uh, when we're looking at it how you can keep these three straight because it relates to three very close proximity and through the word parts and also in the picture, you can help keep them straight. And I'll show you how to do that uh, Wednesday. Ampulla of Vader. Ampulla of Vader. Now, this is an eponym, but they switched it around so that you don't have a possessive notice. And I think that this is what we're going to find that the um, <clears throat> American Medical Transcriptionist Association is going to suggest. Um, either taking off the apostrophe altogether or switching it around like this. Um, because this is one way that you can keep from having the possessive form and yet still using that person's name. Jejunum, jejunum. On 269, we have colonoscopy, colonoscopy. Esophago gastro duodenoscopy. Now, before you panic, that is just made up of word parts and it is not hyphenated. Okay, it's all one word. Esophago, which is the word part for the esophagus. Gastro, which is the word part for stomach. Duoden, which is a word part for the duodenum. And oscopy, which you've had before. So it's not that hard a word. It's going to be one of your easier ones. Pan endoscopy, and as I told you earlier, when you see pan, that means they're going to look at everything. Esophagoscopy, which means they're going to go and look at the esophagus. Proctoscopy, which means they're going to go up through the anal area and look up into the lower part of the colon. Shillings test, but we've had that before, you're shaking your head. Cholecystogram, cholecystogram. Intravenous cholangiogram. That's two separate words. And it's also going to be uh, one of your abbreviation words. On 272, <clears throat> cholecystectomy, cholecystectomy, colectomy, colectomy, excision of Meckel's diverticulum, fistulectomy, fistulectomy, splenectomy, splenectomy, Colace, Colace, <clears throat> Donatol, Donatol, Metamucil, Metamucil. Okay, going on the next page, on page 273 of the textbook, we have the continuation of the drugs, Lomodal, Lomodal, Tagamet, Tagamet, Zantac, Zantac, Malox, you may have some of that on your shelf. Milk of Magnesia, dear old mom, and Mylanta. As a mother, I think I resent using, them using that acronym to describe a laxative. But anyway, Milk of Magnesia, you know, is advertised on TV a lot of times as dear old mom. On page 284, Gavage, Gavage, hematemesis, or it could be hematemesis. Uh, but I usually say hemat-emesis. Icterus, let's see there has a K sound, icterus. On 283, anorexia, anorexia. Bazaar, 
And that one's going to be <clears throat> an unusual word. For those of you who already looked at it, you probably think yuck. It means uh, some foreign substance such as hair down in the, the track. And of course, that can happen. But you know, when you start to think about it, bizarre, the kind of, it's kind of bizarre to think about it. You know? Deglutition, deglutition, duodenal or duodenal, it has both pronunciations, not at the same time, depending on what part of the country and people's favor uh, way of saying it. I usually say duodenal. Islets of Langerhans, that's a phrase together there. Lavage, and we had gavage over in the other column. This one is lavage, and I'll tell you how to keep those separated. Obstipation, which is severe constipation. Polydipsia, polydipsia. Tenesmus, tenesmus, and varix, varix. Okay, and then as it points out, there are four abbreviations out of this chapter that you'll need to know. Starting back on the first page of the theory, <clears throat> the purpose of the digestive or gastrointestinal system is to do what? Receive. Okay, receive and process food. Now it goes on and says, so that it nourishes the body. That's, you can leave off. Mainly what I'm interested in is receiving and processing food. <clears throat> Doctors who specialize in the study of the digestive system are known as gastroenterologists. Um, I'll tell you what, to keep you from having to listen to my voice any more than necessary, where it's just one answer, I'm just going to say number and you tell me what the answer is, okay? Number three is digestion. Number four is absorption. Number five, mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, appendix, and large intestine. Now, before you mark out oral cavity, I didn't, somebody had already said pharynx before I had a chance and I don't want to stop you. But you will need to know mouth or oral cavity. You'll need to know both of them. <clears throat> and on that one, if you'll think about it as we're studying it, you'll learn, you'll kind of learn them in order and it'll, it's a good idea for you to think about them. Even though on this particular one, I'm not going to ask you to list it in order, it'd be a better idea for you to remember them in order. Number six, alimentary. alimentary canal. Number seven, saliva. Number eight, parotid, sublingual, and submaxillary or submandibular. And you only have to remember one of those. <coughs> and submaxillary would probably be easier. <coughs> but parotid, sublingual, which means under the tongue and then submaxillary, which we're going to learn in chapter six when we study the musculoskeletal that the mandible is this jawbone here and the maxil or maxilla is this upper. And so that's why they're saying sub because in both cases they're talking about under the jaw. Number nine, peristalsis. Ten, okay, carry food to the esophagus. You'll notice here but I'm not asking for anything other than its function in the digestive system, keeping in mind that it is also serving the respiratory system when we're breathing. But I'm not asking for you to tell me that. Number 11, that's sphincter's word. Number 12, okay, it's called by two names. One is called lower esophageal, and the other was called cardiac valve sphincter. Now, when you hear cardiac valve, you'd almost want to think of what? The heart. <clears throat> but what you've got to realize, your esophagus comes down so far, and your stomach is in the close proximity where the esophagus attaches to the stomach. And so they're, they're referring to it as the cardiac valve sphincter because of it being close to the heart. Okay? But it's not part of the heart. Yes? Oh, we have to through the words. Cardiac valve sphincter. Um, I believe the way the question is worded, you wouldn't have to put the word sphincter. Yeah. 
uh, I think it's referred to as cardiac valve yeah. or lower esophageal. But in both cases, the word sphincter would be put on there if it was worded a certain way. In other words, the doctor would refer to it as a cardiac valve sphincter or a lower esophageal sphincter. It's just the way that the question is worded. You wouldn't necessarily have to put the word sphincter. However, notice that it is spelled for you there. Number 13, pyloric, pyloric valve. <clears throat> this is the valve at the opposite end of the stomach, between the stomach and the small intestine. Now here it's referred to as pyloric valve. However, that's the adjective form. If we were using the word pylorus, we would not say valve, we would just say pylorus, okay? See the difference? Pyloric is a, an adjective form, and we would have to say pyloric valve. We would never use pyloric by itself. <clears throat> Number 14, Ruge, Aruga, R-U-G-A-E, okay? Number 15, pepsin and hydrochloric acid. Uh, hydrochloric acid is strong enough if, if you were to drop it in full strength onto a piece of the carpet or tile, it would eat right through. But in the stomach, it is protected with a, a lining which is constantly replenishing itself. And once it mixes with the food, it starts breaking it down as well. And then there are also some juices that are put in by like the pancreas, et cetera, that help to break it down. But it's a very powerful stuff. Number 16, right, averaging around 20 feet. Number 17, duodenum or duodenum. It's the first part of the small intestine. Number 18, the liver. Number 19, gallbladder. Number 20, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And you need to, that's the order in which they're presented. And uh, I believe on the test I ask you to name those in order. So it'd be duodenum, jejunum, and then ileum. Number 21, pancreas. Okay, and you'll notice that uh, it helps to neutralize the acid that's produced by the stomach. Number 22, <coughs> right, ileocecal valve. There is a part, the reason they're referred to as small intestine and large intestine is because one is smaller than the other. And just like when you're doing plumbing, you can't to take two pipes that are two different sizes and put them together. So it is with the intestine. We can't just take the small intestine and attach it to the large intestine. So there's a, a pouch called the cecum where the, the uh, small intestine comes in and connects on one side and then it comes out as the large intestine on the other side. And the ciliocecal valve is at that juncture where it becomes into the ileum, uh, from the ileum into the cecal, or cecum rather. 23, small, 24, Fecal, fecal, right, matter, fecal matter. <clears throat> 24 is fecal matter, 25, colon or large intestine, associate those two. Number 26, ascending, transverse, descending, rectosigmoid, rectum, and anus. And, um, those are listed there in the order. Ascending, transverse, descending, rectosigmoid, rectum, and anus. And you need to be sure and, and uh, list those in order as well. Number 27, hemorrhoidal veins. And number 28, mesentery. In the alimentary canal, which is another name for the digestive system, we find the following parts that you'll need to be able to identify. The top three parts indicate the salivary glands. The one that's over on the left-hand side of the illustration is the salivary gland, which is right under the tongue, which is called the sublingual salivary gland. 
The one that's located in the lower jaw is referred by two names, submaxillary or submandibular salivary glands. And the one that's over on the right-hand side of the top, which is located up in the upper part of the mouth or in the palate, is referred to as the parotid salivary glands. As the food enters into the mouth and is uh, chewed, the saliva mixes in with it, it is swallowed, and is then uh, goes into the back of the throat or the pharynx and then goes down on into the esophagus, remembering that this offshoot here represents the trachea, which we study in the, wind, in the respiratory system. The trachea, remember, is the windpipe. It's not shown in its entirety because we are not studying that part. So we see the esophagus here, which moves on down into the stomach. The stomach is this organ right here, and it is superimposed with this dotted organ, which represents the pancreas. The reason that the pancreas is a dotted organ is because the pancreas is actually on the underside. From the stomach, we move into the part, first part of the small intestine, which is this line right here, which is the duodenum or the duodenum. The duodenum then connects with the middle portion of the small intestine, which is called the jejunum, and that's actually over on this side. And then the lower portion of the small intestine, which is the ileum, is shown right by this uh, line right here. So we have the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Now going back up to this, we have this line pointing to the liver, which is this large or organ right here. And then sh on the underside of the uh, liver, we have the gallbladder. It's shown here on the top for visual sight, but keep in mind that the, the gallbladder is actually on the underside of the liver. The parts of the large intestine start at this point where the, the ileum is coming around and connecting to the ileocecal junction, and it comes in and connects to the first part of the large intestine. So this is actually pointing to the cecum here. And then this part that comes up, which is represented by this line, is the ascending colon. And the reason there's two lines is because you need to put ascending and colon. So this part that comes up is the ascending colon. Then the part of the large intestine that goes across is the transverse colon, which is representative of this line right here. So transverse colon. And then the part of the colon that's coming down on the uh, opposite side of the body is referred to as the descending colon because it's coming back down, descending colon. Then we have the part of the colon which starts coming toward the center again and that's called the rectosigmoid. The part that, uh, in the center that starts toward the opening is the rectum and then the opening itself is the anus. The last part of the illustration is this appendage that's hanging down right here referred to as the appendix. And so these are the parts. Let's go through them again. We have the sublingual salivary glands, the submandibular or submaxillary salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, duodenum or duodenum, ascending colon, ileum, cecum, appendix. On the other side, we have the anus, rectum, rectosigmoid, descending colon, jejunum, transverse colon, pancreas, stomach, esophagus, and parotid salivary glands. In the study of the digestive system, when we look at the parts of the organ, we find underneath the lungs, the liver is located at this point here. And as you can see, it goes pretty much from one side almost over completely to the other side of the body in relationship to the other organs. But here are the lungs, and then the liver is located underneath of the lungs. 
Underneath the liver, we find the stomach hidden. And then underneath the stomach, we find the transverse colon that's coming across. So as you can see, the liver, the stomach, and the transverse colon are all pretty much just on, in layers. And when we're studying the colon, what we have to remember is that the small intestine winds around in the abdominal area and comes over and connects to the large intestine or the colon. And this gray area here is the colon. So we have the small intestines that encompass all of this area, comes around and attaches by the ileocecal junction. We have the colon, and this part that comes up here on the side is the, called the ascending colon. So ascending, going up, coming across is transverse colon, and then coming down over on this other side, which is almost hard to see because of the small intestine covering it up. But the, the large intestine continues on over on this side, and that's referred to as the descending colon. If we take out the organs, the lungs, the liver, the stomach, this whole section here will lift out. And we are able to see then the ascending, transverse, descending colon. And then on, on the underside, this part that starts back over is referred to as the rectosigmoid. And then the rectum is the part that comes and starts out uh, more of a center to the, toward the center. And then the opening itself is called the anus. But we want to remember ascending, transverse, descending, rectosigmoid, the rectum and the anus. And that's the part of the large intestine. The small intestine is broken into three parts, remembering the first part that attaches to the stomach, which would be located right here. That's referred to as the duodenum. The middle section is referred to as the jejunum, and then the lower section is referred to as the ileum. So the duodenum or duodenum, the jejunum, middle section, lower portion, ileum.